my name is Wolfie Landstriker, and uh, I've been involved in anarchist activities since about 1978. Probably people who have any familiar familiarity with me have it mostly from Venomous Butterfly Publications, Willful Disobedience, which was a magazine I did for a while. I, as I already mentioned to the interviewer, I'm not really used to being interviewed, so I'm hoping he can ask me some questions that'll help me say more. <laughs> sure. Uh, can you talk a bit more about Venomous Butterfly and Willful Disobedience? Uh, yes. Um, Venomous Butterfly Publications I, and Willful Disobedience I started doing after I'd made a trip to Italy and had some very interesting discussions with anarchists there who'd translated some of my columns from anarchy and felt like there was a certain spirit or tone to their ideas that I thought needed to come into the United States maybe to move the way people did things in a different direction. Um, those ideas tend to get labeled insurrectionary anarchism um, the people in Italy told me very specifically that the only reason that label exists as such is because of um, the anarchists of the Federazione Anarchista Italian Italiana who tend to be very much the type who say you have to wait to struggle until there is a mass struggle going on, whereas the, these other anarchists who got labeled insurrectionary anarchists say, no, we do not wait. Our struggle, our battle against the social order is in our lives here and now, and we need to be fighting against authority every day in our lives. And um, so I decided I wanted... Uh, these ideas were already where how I thought about things, but I, that inspired me to kind of try and make those ideas available to more people within the anarchist milieu, largely. And so I started putting out willful disobedience first as a very small, like, handwritten zine for the first two or three years, and then kind of as a more more refined looking zine later on and venomous butterfly publications was the idea was i wanted to actually get some some of the pamphlets that they had available in italian and i started teaching myself italian so i could translate some of these things and uh get them out and the name Venomous Butterfly Publications actually is taken from a poem written by the anarchist Renzo Novatore, who was very active in uh, throughout World War I and into the early 1920s until he got killed in a shootout with the cops in Italy. And in one of his poems, he talks about the venomous butterfly, and I love that and used it as the name for that project. <laughs> <laughs> and this publication, like Venomous Butterfly, Well-Filled Disobedience, are related for a lot of people who know these publications uh, on this uh, current call Insurrectionary Anarchism. Can you talk a bit more about this okay, um, particular uh, way to be anarchist? As I see it, Insurrectionary Anarchism is... First and foremost, as I said, about um, continually fighting the forces of authority in your life every day, uh, and it's about finding the ways to do that are consistent with what you're doing, that can interweave with uh, the struggles of other people who may not have all of your same critique, but who are also fighting authority in their lives, and so on. and. So, some of the basic factors end up being in the methodology you use. Like if you're an insurrectionary anarchist, you want a methodology that is about being in perpetual conflict with the state. And that means you never negotiate with the state. You don't involve yourself with parties or unions or organizations that ultimately do aim to negotiate with the state. You remain autonomous from 
those sorts of groups and you maintain an attitude of perpetual conflict with every form of authority rather than seeking a bit of peace or some way to get away from that. And those would be the basic basic methodological aspects, basic ways of going about things. And then that means that when, say, larger scale social struggles happen, most of which will involve a lot of people who are quite willing to make compromises, you enter into those struggles with the integrity of maintaining that method and with the recognition that you go along with those struggles only in so far as they are maintaining an attitude of full conflict and non-negotiation with the state and when they start moving towards negotiation you go on with your own struggle uh, without accepting that negotiation without compromising what you're doing so in to me like that part of being able to move away and go along your own path is really pr- one of the most important aspects because it can be easy to just get caught up in a mass struggle and then realize, wait, we've now gone to a place that I never wanted to go and there's starting to be negotiation with the state. There's <laughs> Can you give examples of struggles in the f- the f- this form uh, of uh, insurrectionary anarchist without compromise, without negotiation? Are you thinking of things in the United States or... In the United States or... Um, because I would say, to me... On the large scale, I can't think of much recently in the United States because the United States, even the anarchist milieu, is so politicized that, like, struggles without compromise have mostly been individual struggles. Um, There were a few of us who... Well, there was a situation a few years ago where truckers who worked, did truck driving for the ports along the west coast of the United States, these truckers have no union and a lot of them are immigrants, some of them undocumented immigrants, and so they didn't have a way of actually working through the system, but they had these strikes all up and down the coast. And uh, it was an interesting interesting thing because they also were not just talking about their own, the personal aspects of their trucking experience, they were also like refusing to have anything to do with any ships that were carrying arms for the Iraqi war and so on so they were and their signs would talk about being anti-war as well but th- it was an interesting event and there were some anarchists and some other revolutionaries who were you know going out to talk with these people and to find ways that their struggles could interweave and it was interesting for a while but ultimately the group started moving towards wanting wanting to create a union and then they started moving more in the direction of negotiation and the anarch like the anarchists I knew who were had been trying to interact with them started to move away because it's like okay this is now moving towards working within the system and it's one like to me that's one of the one of the really hard questions like when there isn't a large scale insurrectionary situation going on and there's these smaller struggles what sort of like to me the question is what sort of effect did we have when we went out and talked to these people and i'm not really sure and you know it's the question like for me as an anarchist survival is not the first priority um, and but for most workers it actually is so that at a certain point they start moving back towards figuring out how to maintain themselves within what exists and but you know for I'd say during the first part of that there was this feeling of, of be, being uncompromising, and I think even among the people on the strike, and it's just as time went on, it's like, no, we need to survive, we need to yeah. go on. Like, is uh, sometimes a critic that the people 
involved in anarchist practices makes about insurrectionary anarchist or anarcho individualist or not because it's the same it's not the same sir but like the um, the individualization of the struggles and the um, like the small communities involved in that kind of struggles makes that the struggles can spread and uh, it's why sometimes people talk more about the necessity of mass struggles mm -hmm. not only because they want to make like leftist uh, struggles and uh, just negotiate with the government and push pressure on the government but they also think that a revolutionary or an insurrection uh, cannot be create or cannot spread without this mass struggle well you know the way I see that and this is based to some extent on looking at history is that when you c come at this question thinking of it in terms of mass struggle I see the problem of, of it then the anarchist point or anarchists then tend to take on the idea of bringing the answer to the masses and you start getting this evangelistic thing which I think then sets up a situation where whether you want it or not the anarchists are taking on a leadership role and actually without being aware of it encouraging the aspects psychologically within people to remain followers and for me, it's like, I feel like, and I don't see this as an easy thing to carry on, but I feel like starting from individual struggle and then seeing it more in terms of meeting other individuals who may not share all your ideas and having that more flower out as a branching out of individuals associating voluntarily and ideas being shared more like being shared and being shared means I don't assume I have all the answers even though there are certain things I'm clear about that I want for my life so I come and I'll tell people what I think and listen to what they say they think no matter who they are and have it more uh, not so much going to the mass but having like this this branching out among individuals and to me it's just I see that as the only way that a struggle can grow that's going to actually carry within it what I as an anarchist desire by teaching or not even so much teaching people but by people learning on their own from how they're going about their struggles how to actually not be led and not be obedient <laughs> and and you know that's why like to me I I rarely use the term mass I will talk about large-scale struggles and because ideally for me the individuals in those large-scale struggles don't end up becoming a mass as such yeah like <laughs> mass is more like any to people like a mass like mm -hmm. massified people by the consumer society or by the mm -hmm. industrial society like the a lot of like the critical theory or I don't know how to call this in English theory critic from the Franco Frankfurt school and from other who was talking about the mass society mm -hmm. like the the mass is a concept alienated and is the people alienated by the fact of the states and the capitalism and mm -hmm. how the um, they are uh, the um, they have like heterogeneous interest at the beginning and the heterogeneous lives, but it becomes more and more homogeneous mm -hmm. by the television, by the uh, spectacles, by, by yes, yes, yeah. Um, so thinking <laughs> ads and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that that's where even though this is a word that especially among anarchists in the English language has taken on connotations I don't like I nonetheless appreciate the use some people have made of the term collectivity because to me to me when I hear that word I think more of people rec who recognize their individuality and who recognize that they are not 
all one thing, choosing to come together for specific purposes, as opposed to a mass, which is people who've kind of forgotten their individuality just being together. Uh, like you say, often being made that way precisely due, due to alienating forces. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, totally. And, uh, but if we think about large-scale struggles during the past years, wh what is the struggles around the world who are most inter interested you? I know I found many aspects of what I heard about the struggle against the uh, TAV, the high speed, speed train in northern Italy, very interesting. There were many aspects of that that seemed to have very, um, very strong and fierce, uh, I don't know, fierce battle against the authorities. I know there were also many aspects of that where politicians were wheedling their way in and taking it over and at this point that part of it seems to have it seems ultimately to have dominated it and at this point therefore to have led to basically a defeat where the high-speed train is going to go through not necessarily through the original valley they planned on but this is what happens when you start letting politicians get in and they just they make agreements and mm -hmm. such but there seem to have been many aspects especially in the early part of that that were very interesting and it's also to me really interesting that the large scale movement there happened after there had been more like individual actions that were carried out for years um, in that region um, that apparently people felt sympathetic with and here in uh, North America, like in the United States, because you live there, or in Canada, what struggles are very interesting for you? Right now in the United States, it's hard for me to name any. The, in a certain symbolic way, the uh, when some people from uh, the Lakota Nation down there d claimed... A, claimed some territory and said that they were declaring themselves an independent nation. That was on a symbolic level interesting to me, but it really didn't have a lot to back it up beyond that symbolic level, and I haven't seen it spark anything beyond that. Here in Canada, um, definitely a lot of the uh, indigenous struggles seem to go in very interesting directions and because of that there's been a lot of interesting things that have come out in the way people think like there the fact that there are specifically people who call themselves indigenous anarchists here and who have an analysis often often have an analysis of class as it manifests within they're the various indigenous tribes and nations and I find that particularly interesting because um, it shows that there is not this homo homogeneity within those groups and they're not going to pretend there is. Now, I appreciate that and it seems like uh, anarchists in Canada have many of them have found interesting ways to interact with that. Can you just add a reference for the people who want to be in more informed about this perspective is yours or the, the perspective you are interested by? Like, if the, want, the, the people want to be more informed about insurrectionary anarchist or anarchist ideas, anarchist practice, w which ways to be informed you will give. First I'm going to say that um, Venomous Butterfly as such is not going anymore because I'm, I'm changing how I do my projects and I'm doing it under the name of Vagabond Publications and that has, I can give you a mailbox address for that. Uh, I'll give it twice in, just so people will actually hear it and that is 
3527 Northeast 15th Avenue, number 144, Portland, Oregon, 97212, USA. Again, that's 3527 Northeast 15th Avenue, number 144, Portland, Oregon, 97212, USA. And I will continue to have most of the venomous butterfly stuff available at that address as well. So that, that would be the best way to get in touch with me. You can also get in touch with me for stuff relating to that at acraticus at gmail.com. And acraticus is spelled A-C-R-A-T-I-C-U-S. And that's at gmail.com. And those are the best ways to get in touch with me. And I actually check my paper mail more than my email because <laughs> I don't like computers. <laughs> and you can also just go on a research site in, in the internet and find Welfare Disobedience and Venomous Butterfly. Yes. Um, because you have some publications. Yes, um, other people have put up websites with my stuff on them, and I, because I didn't put them up, I don't remember their U URLs, but if you um, do a search for Willful Disobedient or Venomous Butterfly publications, yeah, they will come up. Or you can go on InfoShop Library, Anarchist Libraries. But most of the times you will find a Wolfville and Striker publication or Venomous Butterfly publication or Wolfville Disobedience and other others mm -hmm. publications like that. Yes. And also check into Elephant Editions because they have a lot of very worthwhile things relating to insurrectionary anarchism as well. In the States right now, the mostly, most a large-scale political activity that's going on is going on completely within the electoral process. Yeah, and maybe we so can talk a little bit more about this. And now is the um, presidential campaign in, in the United States, and is also the campaign here in Canada for yes, the Prime yes. Minister and for the government of Canada. But if we talk more about the United States, what do you think about this campaign and the way they mix politics and the way the people interact with this? Um, well, this particular election is its interesting in what for me is a really negative way. I mean, obviously, I have no interest in electoral politics beyond what it tells me about um, what's going on in the United States or in in a specific society and this year the United States for the first time it's not the first time that women or black people have run for president but it's the first time where they got made any real distance in their campaigns and now the Democratic Party has a black man who is running for president and it's like he's totally you know part of the ruling elite has been for quite a while. He's from a wealthy family, you know, and so on. But he happens to be black, and he happens, in addition, to have a kind of demagogic charm. So he's gotten this huge following where, due to him running, more and more black Americans have registered to vote, and Anyone who knows much about U.S. presidential elections knows that the normal voter turnout is barely 50%. This year it'll probably be way above that because of this. And the only thing I can hope coming out of that is if Obama wins, that maybe some people will have their eyes open to the fact that it doesn't make any difference yeah. what color the president is what gender the president is, and so on. The president is a president. The president is the state, uh, you know, a, a pawn of the state acting for the state is not on the side of anyone who wants 
freedom or who simply wants not to be oppressed. <laughs> but it's like every, like, all this energy that might have been aimed in at least more interesting rebellious ways now is being aimed in supporting this candidate whose basic slogan is hope and change two words which I never trust and especially not out of the mouth of someone who wants to rule (laughs) well my most immediate hopes at this point are to actually stimulate with uh, well I'm, when I go back to Portland it seems like there are more a few of my friends are having very similar feelings to me of frustration with this whole thing and I'm hoping to go back and ha- and see us actually turn this frustration into activity on a it'll, on, on a small scale because it will be that way but seeing seeing us actually daring more than we have been recently <laughs> you know and yeah i know two of my closest friends have expressed wanting to do that sort of thing and for a long time i felt like i kind of am whatever i do i'm doing on my own and when you're kind of completely on your own <laughs> it is it's it is a limit yeah it's not it's not a chain but it is a limit you know it's and it gets frustrating at times, so I'm hoping to see that open up. And I am hoping to see, like, well, with what's been going on in the economy, I'm hoping that the effect on those of us who are pretty much down on the bottom or on the lower end economically, seeing that push more towards and acting out on our anger rather than uh, giving up in despair. (laughs) And there is a lot of anger down there in the United States, and like right now, it's just, it's usually uh, hopeless, well, it's usually, I should say, I don't want to say hopeless because I don't really believe in hope, but it's usually a despairing anger, the other side of the coin of hope. (laughs) Yeah. And to me it's like I don't want either hope or despair, just like, actually starting to act on the anger and it's possible that could happen i would like to see it happen i do think right now people have channeled so much into this basically this almost religious faith in obama that if he wins it will probably be a while you know it'll probably be a while before that expresses itself till people realize that he's the same thing <laughs> What do you think about the Olympics? Well, to me, the Olympi- just the Olympics overall, are, they're always about promoting nationalism, promoting the mentality of competition and competition between people in the name of their nations. And so to me, the Olympics are inherently always a a vehicle to promote authority and promote power. Um, The Olympics coming up here in British Columbia in 2010 are also very specifically an invasion of indigenous land in the name of these institutions of power. And I am actually happy that people are, are standing up against them and pointing out what they actually stand for and I think people have to recognize this they're not just a nice little entertaining sports event they're about promoting very specific values that keep the ruling class in power can you talk a bit more about these values (laughs) well so I was saying, like, a big part of it is promoting nationalism and more specifically nation states. And it's, a, it's about proving which nation state is the best by making use of individuals who've let themselves be used in this way, using their capabilities in competition with other individuals in order to promote this. And so. A big part of it is patriotism, and patriotism is it's basically a 
this kind of religion in which what is worshipped is this artificial political construct in which you happen to be born. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it ends up ultimately keeping ruling classes in power, it keeps people from recognizing that like people on the bottom, the exploited, from recognizing that they have far more in common across borders and just in terms of the fact that they are all exploited and far more reason for each all of them for hating those people who teach them to identify with their nation state instead of with each other um, and to me like I even it was I don't remember exactly when but it was uh, in my childhood where the Olympics went from a four-year event to an event that happens every two years which means the state even feels the need to really push this more and more to push identify with your nation state support your nation state and when do you talk about spirit of sport and about trespass the human condition or something like that what do you think about it <laughs> spirit like spirit of sports it seems like what they mean is they don't mean having fun playing with each other they seem to mean feeling the need to prove yourself better than the other to compete beyond the other and when they take that to uh, like moving beyond the human condition well that en- ends up with people taking that literally and choosing to poison themselves in order to make themselves superhumans and um, and it's like for what purpose exactly isn't isn't the more interesting way of say getting beyond if you're going to talk about getting beyond the human condition it seems the more interesting way is discovering your own individuality which stands absolutely against the whole nation state concept and and the concept of supporting your rulers <laughs> i i consider play to be an essential aspect of life and I consider sports to be a way of actually destroying play by claiming it for this completely anti-play mentality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Being aware of the resistance going on and where you're at and knowing ways that uh, you could maybe bring your struggle into that.